Hello and welcome to my channel or welcome back to my channel. Hope everyone is doing well. Today I have four true ghost stories from the Haunted Canada series. If I pronounce anything wrong, I do apologize. The Viking Ghost Boat, La Anse O Meadows, Newfoundland and Labrador. Most ghosts are doomed to forever haunt one specific location, an old house, a cemetery, an abandoned hospital, shackled by the terrible events that occurred there long ago. But the ghosts of Leif Erikson and the other Norse Vikings that founded a small settlement in Newfoundland in the 11th century aren't content to drop their afterlife anchor in one place. The territory they haunt spans two continents and an ocean. On June 3, 1981, two American tourists walked along a beach near Reykjavik, Javik, Iceland, as the sun set and the warm wind tousled their hair. They were mesmerized by the beauty of the remote land surrounded by cool blue waves. The peaceful walk was suddenly interrupted by the harsh sounds of oars slapping the water. They scanned the ocean for the source of the sound and spotted two distinctive Viking longships being propelled by rows of oarsmen along both sides. The ships had planked hulls and one central mast apiece, each with red and white striped sails. At the helm stood a tall bearded man in Aramaic clothing with a stern, proud face. He shouted something in Norwegian and the ships disappeared from sight. The scared couple returned to town and described to their tour guide what they had seen. A little nervously, the guide told them that they had just seen the Viking ghost ships that sail west from Iceland each summer and arrive in Newfoundland weeks later. Twenty days after sightings of the Viking ghost ships are reported in Iceland, similar reports surface in northern Newfoundland at La Anse U Meadows, the earliest known European settlement in the New World. After the finest catch of the summer, one fisherman stayed late in his hut preparing his fish for sale when he heard the odd sound of oars in the water outside. It was late and he thought all the other fishermen had come ashore for the day. So he peered out his window but saw nothing. Thinking his ears were playing tricks on him, he returned to his work but then heard another sound. Odder yet. A battle horn trumpeted across the water, shaking the halls of his hut. He dropped what he was doing and stepped outside. A thick fog rolled across the water surface. From the center of the mist came the Viking longships with their red and white sails. The man watched in fear and awe as they passed by and disappeared. Years later, a pair of young criminals heard that an old fisherman kept a secret stash of whiskey in his hut by the water. Under the cover of darkness, they broke in and found what they had come to steal. But just as they laid hands on the old man's bottles... They heard the same sound of oars breaking the water, followed by the battle horn. They stole tentative glances through the door and saw the Viking ship's head straight for them. Despite being tough men, they were so frightened that they left the whiskey, ran from the hut, and didn't tell anyone what they had seen until years later when they heard other people share similar accounts. Another fisherman was alone on the water when he was confronted by one of the ghost ships. It had been an exceptionally good fishing day and he decided to stay out on the water later than anyone else. But the winds had suddenly picked up and dark angry clouds covered the sky. It was time to get safely back to harbour, but when he turned his boat's motor, it didn't start. The fuel tank was full and a check of the, of the connections revealed no problems, so he couldn't understand what was wrong. As the storm approached, the man heard oars on the water and stood up to wave, hoping for rescue. The ship he saw was not at all what he had expected, but was the Viking ghost ship sailing to Lance U Meadows once again. It sailed straight for him as if it meant to ram his vessel, but just before the imminent collision, it sounded its battle horn and disappeared before his eyes. The fisherman felt lucky to be alive. 
His luck continued when he tried the engine and it started without fail. The sightings of the Viking ghost ships are often followed by chilling screams of warriors in the woods near the abandoned Viking village. There are some who believe it's the battle cries of the ghosts of ancient Inuit, the people the Vikings called Shrelings. The two sides had many bloody clashes and the Norse greatly outnumbered by the land's inhabitants, were eventually driven back to their homeland, never to return to present-day Canada. One such squirmish between the two sides claimed the life of Leif's brother, Thorveld, who was shot by an arrow and buried near their settlement. When Leif's other brother, Thorstein, who had not joined the others on the expedition to Vinland, heard of Thorvald's death, he was determined to bring the body back home, with a crew of 25 men and his wife, Gudrid. Thorstein set sail to Vinland, but he would never arrive. Bad weather forced them back ashore, and then, to make matters worse, disease broke out amongst the crew early that winter. Thorstein became infected and died. He didn't stay dead, nor did he stay quiet. Not long after succumbing to the illness and taking his last breath, Thorstein's corpse sat bolt upright and his dead eyes flashed open. Those present jumped back in alarm, muttering oaths and curses. Thorstein opened his mouth and three words bubbled out like a pustule erupting. Where is Gudrid? His grieving wife was summoned and she listened. Terrified and silent as Thorstein made a prophecy, he told her she would soon remarry, have children, build a church in Iceland, and live a long life as a nun. Having said his peace, Thorstein fell back down. He neither stirred nor spoke again. This is believed by scholars to be the oldest European ghost story with a connection to Newfoundland. Sometimes dead men do tell tales. La Dame Blanche, Montmorency Falls, Quebec. As the moon rises and casts a rippling silver glow across the Montmorency River, the inhabitants of Isle d'Orleans have seen a haunting figure walking through the mists of Montmorency Falls, thin as a skeleton, pale as frost, and clad in a tattered wedding dress. The waterlogged woman emerges from the depths of the river and rambles along the shore. Her wails echo across the water, that her wispy voice can be heard over the crashing falls, lends credence to the locals' belief that the woman is the ghost of Mathilde Robin, dead for more than 250 years. Whatever you do, don't get it in your head that you would rush to the woman's aid. Those who have gotten too close to the woman in white have learned how deadly she can be. In 1759, Mathilde Robin was the happiest girl in Cote de Bureaupre region. She was young and in love and engaged to Louis Tessier, a strong and honorable farmer who adored her. While Louis worked the land, Mathilde worked in secret designing and sewing by hand the dress she'd wear on her wedding day. After a long day's work, the young couple walked hand in hand under the stars to the top of Montmorency Falls to gaze down at Isle d'Orleans, despite Louis's prodding to describe the dress she had worked so hard on. Mathilde insisted that she would not reveal any details until he saw it on their wedding day at the end of the summer. For Louis would never get that chance. On July 31st, the townsfolk cries shattered the laziness of the hot summer day. The English are at the foot of the falls, they said in panic. They come to take Quebec out of France's hands. With great courage and bravery, Louis volunteered to join the French soldiers to defend his land. Mathilde begged him to remain by her side, but a priest convinced her to take supplies and hide in the forest with the other women and children. With a heavy heart, Louis hugged his fiancée and promised he'd return to her. Mathilde languished in the woods, listening to the chaotic sounds of battle without being able to see what was happening, frayed her nerves and drove her mad with worry. Louis was strong, but he wasn't a trained soldier. She feared the worst. The Battle of Montmorency lasted a few days, but ended in victory for the French. Relief began to pour through the camp in the woods to the surviving soldiers and townsmen returned to their loved ones. 
Mathilde waited and waited, begging for news from the men. Louis Tessier, she called in vain. Has anyone seen him? No one answered. Unable to sit and wait any longer, she ran out of the woods and along the river without caution. She passed soldiers living, dying, and dead. Still, she called for Louis. Still, she was met with stony silence. Maybe he returned home, she thought, and raced to their village, only to find that the English had set it on fire in the first small shred of good fortune to smile on her since Louis had left for battle. Their home stood untouched. She raced inside and searched in the dark for her love, but found no trace of him. Mathilde grabbed her wedding dress, hugged it to her chest, and ran back outside. The dress glowed faintly in the moonlight. Not knowing where to search next, Mathilde finally heard voices calling her name. Hoping for a miracle, she approached the men who had beckoned her, but felt her spirits drop. Their grim faces were drawn tight as a snare drum as they parted to let her pass, and there, lying face down in the dirt on the shore, was a man she instantly recognized. Mathilde was too late, or Louis was dead. Consumed by grief, Mathilde climbed the hill and stood at the top of the falls. Acting as if in trance, she slipped into her wedding dress, the dress she would never get to reveal to her groom. She spread her arms out to her sides, looked down upon Isle d'Orleans, as she had done what felt like a lifetime ago with Louis, and leapt off the edge her body was never recovered. That hasn't stopped her from returning at night, with the moon scoring the shores for her one true love. Perhaps had Louis spirit remained by her side, Mathilde would have found peace. Instead, her anguished moans carried on the wind, terrorized locals and tourists alike. The inhabitants of Isle d'Orleans know to remain in the safety of their homes when the woman in white is afoot. It's said that anyone who touches her ill-fated wedding dress will die a sudden and horrible death a few days later. Other than Mathilde, that dress was meant to be touched by one person and one person only. The Man in the Mirror, White Rock, British Columbia. One cold winter night, Jeremy Ellis was closing the Washington Avenue Grill. It was 1.30 a.m. Ellis was alone. The moonlight reflected brightly off freshly fallen snow outside. The neighborhood was quiet and calm, unexpected and unannounced. An odd-looking man barged into the restaurant and startled Ellis, who was nearly ready to head home. I'm a ghost hunter, the stranger said, and urgently asked to investigate the restaurant right there and then. It was as if he had no idea how late the hour was, nor how much of a burden his request would be. Showing the self-proclaimed ghost hunter to the door, Ellis politely denied the request and hoped the man would be understanding. Luckily, he left without further incident. No sooner had the door closed when the lights began to flicker on their own than Ellis happened to look at one of the restaurant's mirrors. There, standing behind him, he saw the reflection of a shadowy figure, an old man. When he spun around, no one was there. He raced downstairs and made sure all the doors were locked. They were, and then searched the restaurant to see if he was well and truly alone. There was no sign of either the ghost hunter or the shadowy man he'd seen in the mirror. The Washington Avenue Grill is located in a yellow building that overlooks Semiamu Bay. Their menu features upscale Pacific Northwest cuisine, while their dessert menu lists something you might not expect to find in your typical restaurant. A true ghost story. Before the restaurant opened in 1997, the building served many different purposes. It was built in 1913 by the Campbell River Lumber Company and operated as a lumber mill that employed up to 400 workers during World War I. After the mill closed, the building became a Presbyterian church, a schoolhouse, and a boarding house for migrant railway workers. In 1934, it became the house of Edward Sharp a caretaker responsible for the building and the property surrounding it. Sharp's tragic story is the one that graces the dessert menu. By all accounts, Sharp was a peculiar man and a bit of a loner. He shunned all human contact and never ventured into town. 
His days were spent puttering around the old building and tending to the grounds. Sharp was such a solitary creature that no one could recall ever hearing him speak. But there came one night when his painful screams were impossible to miss. On a cold November night in 1943, a wicked storm raged through White Rock, forcing the locals into the safety of their homes where they locked their doors and lit fires for warmth. Although the storm was deafening and everyone was inside on the fateful night, most of the townsfolk thought they could hear anguished wails echo throughout the surrounding hills. Life returned to normal after the storm, or at least it seemed to at first. But then people began to realize Old Man Sharp hadn't been seen tending to the property for a few days. Daily tasks had been left undone. A search of the grounds found that he had disappeared without a trace, leaving his belongings behind. The locals began to speculate as to what happened to Sharp. Some claimed he'd been hit by a train the night of the storm. Others said he had decided to go for a late-night polar bear swim and drowned. A few believed the years of solitude had gotten the better of him and he finally snapped, taking his own life. Regardless of which story they believed, everyone agreed the wails they had heard that night were the final sounds Sharp would utter in this world, but they didn't know he would come back. These days, his spirit is far from pleasant, which makes perfect sense. Sharp was a man who hated company, and now his private residence is filled with restaurant-goers, intruders, day in and day out. He expresses his displeasure by turning the lights on and off, moving objects around the restaurant, and even damaging the property. One time, the handle suddenly broke off the coffee pot and sailed across the room. Another time, half the restaurant's selection of wine bottles flew from the wall and shattered on the floor. Objects have been known to explode without warning, and restaurant staff love to recall the time two burly, tattoo-covered busboys ran from the back of the kitchen in a dead panic. They had seen a bin lift itself in the air and then hurtle across the room. The incident had left them as pale as a couple of ghosts. It also seems Sharp has found his voice in the afterlife. People hear him moaning and yelling in the walls and ceilings of the restaurant. Others have felt him rush past and push them from behind. Like the night Ellis was startled by the appearance of the old man's reflection, Sharp's favorite scare tactic is to appear suddenly in mirrors. Owner Brent Gray recalls the time a woman walked quickly out of the bathroom, reported that she had seen a spirit in the mirror, and said she'd never return to that restaurant. Some of the restaurant's patrons have reported seeing other ghosts float across the street in front of the Washington Avenue Grill and enter the dining room late at night. The troublemaking spirits rattle tables, whistle in the basement, and play with diner's hair. Oddly, they always take care to leave the restaurant before it gets too late. They know something, it would seem, that we don't. The ghost of Edward Sharp demands to be left alone. Although the living have yet to fully comply, the dead are careful to keep a safe distance from the caretaker after nightfall. Once upon a death, Ottawa, Ontario. The Fairmont Chateau Laurier is a hotel that resembles a fairy tale castle, built of limestone with turrets that reach to the sky. It's situated beside the Parliament Building's Our Nation's Capital. It's as much a historic landmark as it is a place of lodging, having welcomed kings and queens, princes and princesses, movie stars and famous athletes. But beneath the hotel's happily ever after appearance lies something decidedly less radiant, something sinister. Whispers and rumors travel the city streets, warning locals and tourists that a night spent in the Chateau Laurier is a night spent sleeping with the dead. One young couple who recently stayed for a few nights hadn't heard the ghost stories. After checking in and marveling at the elegant beauty of their guest room, they were unprepared what was to happen next. By the time they checked out, however, they left convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that the hotel was haunted. The room, it would seem, was already occupied and whatever was lurking there didn't seem to appreciate the living company. The couple got settled in the room, then the man had some errands to tend to, so the woman stayed behind alone. She tried to relax, but she was filled with an uneasy feeling. Something was wrong. 
As she tried to figure out what was giving her the creeps, something brushed against her arm. She jumped in fright and scanned her surroundings. But her husband hadn't returned. She was still by herself. Then it happened again. Something unseen ran its fingers along her skin. Powerless and petrified, the woman could do nothing but pretend her imagination was playing tricks on her. For the next hour, something unseen continued to brush up against her arm. Perhaps like a horror movie cliché, the presence was dwelling in the shadows of her room's closet. Late one evening, after a night on the town, she was getting ready for bed when something happened that took her breath away. She was removing her makeup in front of a large mirror. Something caught her attention. In the mirror's reflection over her shoulder and behind her back, the closet door slowly opened with a creak that cut through the quiet of the night. The next morning, the woman took a nice warm shower and tried to forget all about what had happened. As the water washed away, the aches and pains of sleepless night spent tossing and turning, a hand pressed up against the woman's shoulder blade. She spun around with a gasp, but no one was there. The angry spirit that refuses to check out of the Chateau Laurier belonged to Charles Melville Hayes, a railway president from turn-of-the-century Canada. Hayes oversaw the construction of many grand hotels at major train stops, including the Chateau Laurier. The hotel was named after Canada's seventh prime minister, despite the fact that one of Laurier's ministers once called Hayes cruel and tyrannical. Cruel and tyrannical he might have been, but Hayes was also an ambitious and exacting project manager. He insisted on approving nearly every minute detail of the hotel's construction, even traveling to Europe to handpick the final furnishings before the grand opening. But as fate would have it, these furnishings and Hayes himself would never complete the journey home to Ottawa. They sank on the floor of the Atlantic, not far from Newfoundland, where they still remain today. Hayes had boarded the RMS Titanic, the well-known passenger liner that struck an iceberg and sank on April 15, 1912, during its maiden voyage. The Chateau Larrière was due to open on April 26, but the opening was postponed till June. What was meant to be a time of celebration was a somber affair. The need to see his hotel in its complete state was too great for death to get in his way, and Hayes had been spotted in various parts of the Chateau Larrière. He's most active on the 8th floor, where an executive suite is named in his honour. A shadowy figure that fits his description has been spotted floating through the hallways and hotel. Staff regularly hear rattling sounds in empty wings. A man who worked 30 years cleaning guest rooms at the Chateau Laurier experienced many creepy events. But what unnerved him more than anything was the fact that he often needed to clean rooms twice. Time and again, he'd finish one room and step outside for the briefest flicker of time only to return to find the room had been completely messed up again and the furniture rearranged. The staff know that the hotel is haunted and can prepare themselves for the inevitability that they will sooner or later be accosted by a ghost. But many guests who check in for a night or two, like the woman who felt something touch her arm, arrive completely unprepared for the fright of a lifetime. Take, for example, another guest who fled her room for the safety of the lobby because all of her personal belongings had flown through the air on their own. Or the man who didn't believe in ghosts before checking into the hotel on a business trip one late October. Upon his arrival, he was overwhelmed by an eerie feeling, as if something was warning him to turn around and leave. Once he was in his room, a new but equally frightening feeling took root deep in his soul. He became very depressed and felt like he was completely alone in the building, despite the fact that most of the 429 guest rooms were occupied. The businessman left to clear his head, then returned later that evening and went straight to sleep. But it wasn't long before his sleep was interrupted in the middle of the night. He woke when a start, when someone sat down on the bed beside him. He rubbed his eyes. There was no one there. But in the spot where he had felt the person sit down, he sensed an energy that slowly drained down into his mattress. 
How much sleep do you think he got after that? Needless to say, the skeptic had turned into a believer. He returned to Ottawa many times for business, but was far too scared to return to the Chateau Larrier. If you're still not convinced that the hotel is haunted, heed the tale of a trusted journalist who had a bone-chilling night in one of the famed suites. In the 1980s, Patrick Watson, CEO of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation at the time, was sound asleep when he heard a crack as loud as a gunshot. He sat bolt upright and saw on a table in the living room a heavy glass ashtray. Somehow it was cracked clean in half. The incident left Watson with an uneasy feeling, a sensation that dissipated in the morning but returned the next night when he was awoken by another loud sound, this time from the bathroom. Something had picked up his toiletry kit, which he clearly remembered securing on the counter behind the taps and thrown it across the room, scattering the contents across the floor. Like the broken ashtray, there was simply no way to explain the phenomenon, and Watson admitted to being left quite shaken from his stay in the Chateau Laurier. Spend a night in this fairy tale hotel, and you might not live so happily ever after, after all. Thank you for listening. If you like this type of content, please consider subscribing and liking to my channel, and I will see you on the next one.